part three, the final part of our training on the Eucharist. This has been a fast-paced, scripture-rich look at the historical ritual, the celebration of the death, birth, resurrection of Jesus. The ritual does that through a memorial meal called the Eucharist or Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper. And generally, you'll hear people refer to this celebration as the Eucharist, and that's how I'll do it. As we did on the other two segments of this teaching, I'm doing this teaching both on YouTube and on a WebEx. And so the WebEx people are over here. If I look over here, that's who I'm talking to. And you may hear disconnected voices. That's coming from the WebEx. And then my scriptures are over there when I look at that. If you missed any of the first two parts of this teaching, or you need a refresher, uh, we covered lots of material, then go to our YouTube channel. It's Three Streams TV, the number three space streams, S-T-R-E-A-M-S, space TV. And when you get there, you're looking for Euch Eucharist Training 1 and Eucharist Training 2. And while you're there, please subscribe. So far, we have gone over the scriptural basis of the Eucharist. We looked at what the early church fathers were writing back and forth to themselves during the first 350 years of the church. Uh, we've looked at some of the mechanics of the Eucharist, like what bread and wine do you use? We looked at how can the bread and wine become the body and blood of Jesus? We looked at how Paul saw healing in the Eucharist done right, and he saw sickness and even death in the Eucharist done wrong. We even touched on a little bit about liturgy. Liturgy is not only what's used in the Eucharist, but it's a good thing general. And we also looked at the traditional order of a service, uh, the Eucharist service and some of the terminology that might be used. We use terms like uh, words of institution, epiclesis, uh, sursum corda, <laughs> things like that. And today we're going to pick up at where we left off and we're going to look at some more details about the Eucharist. And we'll answer the question, I hope by the end of this training, why are only priests and bishops authorized to consecrate the elements of the Eucharist? So let's start in with some Eucharist details. Receiving communion is a time of worship and prayer. It's not a time to visit or talk or go get coffee or play with the children. Take advantage of this time to do, I'm going to suggest at least a couple of things. One is just relax and worship with the Lord. Contemplate all the aspects of this celebration. Renew your baptismal vows. Renew your commitment to serve God completely. Recall what God has done for you in your life. And the other thing is just use it as a time to pray. If there's a line of people going up to receive Eucharist, and I'm in that line, I'm not a celebrant, I like to put my hands on whoever's in front of me and pray over them as we go to receive. Some folks will get together with their family afterwards, kind of do a huddle and pray together. I think that's a great thing to use the Eucharist time for. So what about the hardware and the elements of the Eucharist? We're just talking about the kind of miscellaneous details, right? Turn to 1 Corinthians 10 with me. 1 Corinthians 10. We're going to look at verses 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 reads, Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break or the loaf which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, we all partake of the one loaf. The cup and the bread are the sharing of the body and blood of Jesus. In verse 16, Paul talks about the cup 
that is blessed. We know that part of the Eucharist ritual is the celebrant blesses and prays over the bread and the wine. I will serve these little individual cups if that's what people need, but that's not what Paul was talking about. He was talking about a common cup. And the idea is we share a common cup. Now, some Roman Catholic churches have decided not to do that anymore. They uh, receive communion only in the host. I think that's a mistake. You know, during the Middle Ages, during the Black Plague in Europe, almost everyone was Roman Catholic. And the Roman Catholic Church at that time still served communion from a common cup. And supposedly, the, the folks that lived during that time said there was not a single case or a single instance where they could tie back a transmission of the Black Plague to the common cup. I believe that's because of the healing that comes from Eucharist personally. But there, and there have been other studies that show that people... Uh, are really not likely to get sick from that. But anyhow, I like a common cup. And Paul also talks there about a single loaf. I like to use a single loaf for two reasons. One, it represents the body of Jesus as a single whole. But second of all, it's broken to remind us that Jesus was broken on our behalf. When the celebrant breaks the loaf, that's called the fraction, that's the time to remember that Jesus was broken for you. You know, some use individual wafers. Okay, if you want to do that, that's okay, I guess. I really don't like that. I really prefer uh, a single loaf. So what should be in the cup? Wine, grape juice, or something else? Why use wine? It's an alcoholic beverage <laughs> in a church function. Why not just use grape juice? Well, I'm going to explain why the church has always used wine. And then I'll explain why I will serve grape juice sometimes to anyone who might be offended by the wine or for some other reason just absolutely cannot receive wine or alcoholic content at communion or any other time. Now, some will say that when the Bible says wine, it means grape juice. And I think you really have to work hard to get that out of the scripture. <laughs> you know, you can't drink grape juice and get glad, right? Psalm 104 verse 15 talks about how wine makes the heart glad. And you sure don't have to admonish anyone to drink in moderation if you're talking about grape juice. The, God does despise drunken behavior. How could you do that if that was grape juice? In the Bible, when they talk about wine, they're talking about fermented grape juice that has some alcoholic content to it. Of course, when we receive the cup, we're not taking gulps. We're taking tiny sips. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 20. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11. We're going to look at verses 20 through 22. Paul had to correct the Corinthian believers on how they celebrated the Eucharist. And we'll see that here. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 20. Therefore, when you meet together, is it not to eat the Lord's Supper? <laughs> that alone is an interesting statement. <laughs> It almost sounds like Paul said, you know, that's the primary reason for you guys getting together is to celebrate the Eucharist. Anyway, verse 21. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this, I will not praise you, Paul says. They had corrupted the right of Holy Communion. And it had become some kind of big meal or something. And obviously, they used wine because people were getting drunk. 
Paul didn't tell them don't use anything that's fermented. He said don't get drunk in a church service. Let's not make this a debate about whether or not it's okay to drink alcohol, okay? I've seen so many lives destroyed by alcohol that I would gladly ban all alcohol from the face of the earth. But it appears that the New Testament and the early church fathers allowed alcohol in moderation at least for Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper. And we're not talking about gulps of alcohol. We're talking about tiny sips. And, and we're talking about doing this in accordance with the command of Jesus. So why use red wine? Well, I use, like to use red wine for two reasons. One is just the symbolism of that. I think there are three characteristics of wine that make it a perfect symbol for communion. Not too long ago, I was in a church, uh, they had a communion service, and they served some kind of a white wine. It was a, I don't know what it was, but it was a white wine, and I thought, that doesn't make sense. One of the reasons that I like red wine is because the grapes are crushed just like Jesus was crushed. Number two, the grape juice undergoes a chemical change just as Jesus was changed at the resurrection just as we are changed when we accept him as our savior and we rise from the waters of baptism to walk in newness of life and then the third reason back to this red wine idea is blood is red it represents his blood okay now if for no other reason, the second reason I like to use red wine is because that's what Jesus used. And we were told to repeat what he did. Jesus was, I think, celebrating Passover. There's no record that even implies that any group of Jews ever used grape juice for Passover instead of wine. So what if red wine or purple grape juice aren't available and you really want to celebrate the Eucharist. You're out in the bush of Africa or who knows where and you forgot to bring your table wine with you. Guess what? As far as I'm concerned, use water, use papaya juice, use coffee, use something liquid, okay? I think it's preferable to reverently use whatever you have than to miss out on Holy Communion. But if you can do any planning in advance, then have red wine available. That's to me the ideal. That's the best. And so having said all that about the mechanics of Eucharist and what I believe is best and ideal, okay, what about the Christians who are in churches that celebrate communion just occasionally? And even when they do, they're not really receiving the real presence of Jesus. Or what about the Christians who don't receive Holy Communion ever? Are they not saved or maybe not spirit-filled? Let me explain why I asked that question, okay? I'm not condemning anybody. You're going to see in a minute. John 6. I want to ask the question because it's, it's, it's a valid question that comes up, okay? In John 6, verses 51 through 58, Jesus is talking here to a group of people. And he says in uh, John 6, 51, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And so Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. 
he who eats this bread will live forever. Jesus declares that Christians must eat his flesh and drink his blood. And he further declares that those who refuse to do that do not have access to eternal life later or life in Christ now on this earth. Now we know that people who improperly celebrate the Eucharist are more likely to be sick and die. Is it even remotely possible that John's words here are accurate and the folks who don't celebrate Eucharist at all or they don't do it acknowledging the real presence of Jesus that they don't have eternal life? Uh, to me that just seems, I, it's hard to imagine that that would actually be the case. Some of the early church fathers, though, taught that. They were certain that if you didn't receive the Eucharist, you weren't saved. I'm not going to even try to answer that question, okay? <laughs> I'm just going <laughs> to throw the hand grenade in your thinking and leave it there. To me, for me and my house, we're going to celebrate the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist every chance we get. And I'm just not going to worry about sickness or eternal darkness or anything else. But um, I'm going to get all the richness I can out of this ceremony. So I promised I would address the issue of who can celebrate Eucharist and who can consecrate the elements. It's going to take us a while. Stay with me on this, okay? When I say the elements, of course, I'm talking about the bread and the wine that's used in the Eucharist. There are lots of views on this, and I'm going to tell you what the CEC believes, what our denomination believes. And as it turns out, I think our views are generally shared amongst many different Christian communions, and we believe that our views reflect the early church views. Surrounding the Holy Communion, different folks have different roles. There's usually an altar guild, uh, usually made up of some of the ladies in the church, and they take the responsibility of cleaning and preparing the cloths and the utensils. And they also make sure that we're using the right colors for the season, since I usually forget. Um, usually, a deacon is the one who prepares the table at the time of communion. Anybody who is approved by the celebrant can serve communion when it comes time for folks to receive. All deacons and others who have been specifically commissioned by the church as Eucharistic ministers can use pre-consecrated elements for a communion service. This is called a deacon's mass or holy communion under special circumstances. It's designated to take communion to the sick, to shut-ins, uh, or to provide communion in a service where there's no priest, for instance. Which brings us to those who can officially, those who are sanctioned by the church, to consecrate the bread and the wine. That means to pray the prayer of consecration over the elements so that they actually become the body and blood of Jesus. Remember, until the elements have been prayed over with this prayer, they're just bread and wine. And we saw that even amongst the early church fathers. The conversation about who can consecrate, in my mind, starts with order and organization. All human organizations have some kind of order to them or they just turn into chaos. There's some kind of division of labor. There's some kind of responsibility structure. Notice I said responsibility structure, not authority structure. We usually think of human organizations in terms of a structure of authority. But you know, the truth is that you only need authority to the extent that you have a responsibility to carry out. And so the real organization of, of any human organization is about 
responsibility. So different people have different responsibilities, different levels of responsibility, and hopefully that means they also have been given the authority to act within, the, to carry out whatever responsibility they have. In the early church, it's obvious from the Gospels, the book of Acts, that the apostles were at the top of the org chart with disciples under their responsibility and under their authority. Apostles didn't rule with autonomy, though. They involved the community in major decisions, and we see that they appointed deacons to serve and to help uh, with their tasks. Turn to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 2 through 6. Acts 6, starting in verse 2, says, So the twelve, that's the original apostles, summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This statement found approval with the whole congregation. See what I mean? They weren't operating in some kind of dictatorship, right? And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And they chose Philip and Prochius and Nicanor and Timon and Phernius and Nicholas. Uh, y'all, you guys in your graves, forgive me for mispronouncing your names. These they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. That was an ordination service. This is probably the first ordination service that you get to see in the Bible. They were ordaining men to this position of being a deacon and the primary role of a deacon matches the name of the word that Greek word deacon means someone who serves or serves in ministry. Now as the church expanded authority and responsibility um, of the apostles also began to expand and what they did was the original apostles began to appoint what they called overseers or bishops. Turn to Titus 1-7. The little book of Titus, chapter 1, verse 7. Paul here is talking about the characteristics that you're looking for of a person that you might want to appoint as overseer over an area or congregation. And he says, For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not found of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled. He goes on and on. He's describing the characteristics that you're looking for for someone that you're going to assign this responsibility of being an overseer or to me, it's really just uh, they're taking the role or the place of the apostles as the apostles died. They had already appointed overseers that ended up taking their place. Uh, there's some conjecture amongst the church. Uh, all, when the apostles died, there were no more apostles after that. That's, that's it. Some have said, nope, if you're acting like an apostle, then you can call yourself an apostle. In our church... That role is taken by someone who is called a bishop. The word bishop comes from the Greek word episcopus, which just means overseer. Okay. When I was in the Assembly of God Church, we had district managers. They were the overseers. Okay. So we also see how priests were appointed in the church. If you go up a couple of verses, Titus 1 verse 5, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order, uh, talking that's where the word ordination comes from, by the way, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. That word elder is the Greek word uh, presbyteros. And that's the word from which we get our English word priest. And so he was talking about appointing priests 
or what today we might call rectors or pastors in local churches. All of these titles are really just special work assignments. In the human organization of the chart, you got to have roles, you got to have division of labor. Turn to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. Verses 28 through 29. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 reads, And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracle, are they? What Paul is talking about here is he's giving examples of this idea of God-ordained work assignments, I think you'd call it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we read how Paul excoriates the Corinthians for desecrating the Eucharist. Apparently, the Corinthians weren't following the Eucharist ritual as Paul had delivered it to them on an earlier visit. Remember, He said, this came from the Lord. This is not me making this up. They weren't even honoring the sacred nature of this memorial meal. And I think that this call caused Paul and the other apostles to realize that they needed better formalization in the organization of the church in general. And they needed to have this main celebration, this main act of worship, the Eucharist, to be better organized as well. And so we see that the teachings of the early church fathers specified that only priests and bishops could consecrate the elements. In other words, consecrating the elements was part of their job description. Priests and bishops were especially trained. They were especially appointed by the church in ordination to properly carry out this divine ministry or mystery of the Eucharist. It's It's sacred, and it needs to be done in a proper way. Remember, Paul talked about sickness and death could result from not doing Eucharist in a proper way. Well, one way to avoid this is to limit who can preside over the ritual and make them accountable to do it right. Make them accountable to the church. Personally, I think the theology of why this was their job description kind of developed later. It was a practical reason they did it at first. The theology says that these ordained ministers are spiritual heads of the church, the priest and the overseer or the bishop, which of course is true. And as such, when they celebrate Eucharist, some are certain that they do it in persona Christi. That means they are acting in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, Some even teach that the celebrant actually becomes Jesus when celebrating. That's more of an Eastern Orthodox kind of uh, idea, something that goes a little bit beyond my spiritual proofs, okay? My scriptural proofs. God's structure of government is the family. He deals with heads of households for government matters. The church is structured like an extended family, with the bishop being the grandfather, the local priest being the father of the house, and then you got everybody in the house, and they have different job assignments as well. Another part of the theology of this, about this part of a priest and bishop's job description, is that the congregations have approved them. And they know that this is part of their job description. And what they're doing is they're giving assent or consent to the concept that only bishops and priests have been especially anointed or laid hands on to carry out this sacred task. For 2,000 years, the position of the church has been that only priests and bishops are authorized to consecrate the elements. Some have taken that to mean that only priests and bishops can actually cause the consecration to occur. I think that's a stretch, personally. (laughs) Others take it to mean that we are just better off leaving some important things like the Eucharist in the hands of those who are experienced, trained, and authorized by the church. 
Yeah, but why is a priest different from anybody else in the universal priesthood of believers? Turn to 1 Peter 2. See, I explained it so well, and now I'm going to trash it, right? 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. But you are a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We Christians are literally a whole nation not just a priest, but royal priest, priest to the king. 1 Peter 2 and verse 5. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We Christians have been built into a holy priesthood. So we're all priests. And we all then must be approved to perform this sacred ritual, right? Well, if we're all royal holy priests, then why do apostles appoint different people to different offices? One of the specific reasons a priest is ordained is so they can consecrate the Eucharist. When I was ordained, most of the words that were said over me in that service were about me consecrating and celebrating the Eucharist. I, that was drilled into me as training that this was my primary job. Do the Eucharist and do it right and do it on a regular basis. To many churches, this is the main function of the priest. So in our communion, in the charismatic Episcopal Church, only priests and bishops are authorized to consecrate the elements of Eucharist. Anyone who is approved by the bishop or local priest can serve the elements, but those elements must first be consecrated by a priest or a bishop. In some churches, only very special people can be approved as Eucharistic ministers. Uh, that means to serve the Eucharist to others. I think that's going a little too far. Originally, that was the deacon's job, to serve Eucharist in the regular church service, but then also to take Eucharist to the sick or anybody that was unable to attend a church. When a deacon serves communion to someone, that's called a deacon's mass. And in the Book of Common Prayer, if you go to page 396, page 396 in the Book of Common Prayer, you will find a service for communion under special circumstances. That's what we call a deacon's mass. Notice that a deacon's mass includes one New Testament reading at least. It includes a prayer of repentance. It includes everyone saying together the Lord's Prayer. And then finally, it includes receiving the elements. The elements that were already consecrated by a priest or a bishop. And then, so if you're answer, asking the question, where do the elements for the deacon's mass come from? Well, you know what? Maybe the priest... On Sunday morning, when he celebrated the Eucharist, he made sure there was some, some extra elements. Or sometimes the way we do, we'll make sure that there's extra bread, there's extra wine. It's all on the table when I consecrate that. But then we preserve it. Actually, it's called reserved sacrament. We keep it. And I've, I've authorized members of our church who want to celebrate the Eucharist at home to use reserve sacrament and conduct the deacon's mass in their home. I like the symbolism of the head of the house leading and serving this service. But if they're not available, any member of the church should be able to do this. Anybody that the celebrant trains a little bit should, you know, should be able to do this at home. I encourage you to receive communion every day if you're overcoming some kind of illness or if you're facing some kind of difficult situation and you, you just want to be, you want to purposely bring the presence of God into your house or into your life or your home. That's a perfect opportunity. Serve the deacon's mass, serve communion from reserved elements. And use that as a prayer to encounter Jesus in a real way. So where do we get sacrament from? 
if you bring bread and wine to a church service and let your priest put that bread and wine on the communion table during the Eucharistic prayers, then you have reserved sacrament. Or when we have Eucharist over WebEx, when you put set your table, include a container of wine and some bread so that those are on the table when I say the Eucharistic prayers. And when I'm praying those prayers, I'm not just praying over my table. I'm praying over all the tables of everyone that's connected. Whatever table is set during those Eucharistic prayers, whatever's on that table is consecrated and is holy to the Lord. And again, this is one of the things the church has taught for 2,000 years. And it can include holy water. It can include anointing oil. It can include your wallet. So that gives you the reserve sacrament. Now, what do you do with it and how do you store it? Well, since it is indeed the body and blood of Jesus, you need to treat it with special reverence. The kids can't make sandwich with that bread, okay? <laughs> you can't have a glass of that wine at the end of a hard day, okay? <laughs> it's reserved sacrament. It needs to be stored away and treated as holy. The bread may have to be kept in the fridge or the freezer so it doesn't ruin, you know, depending on how long it's going to be before you use it all. When you have your mass at home, whatever glass you use as a chalice, needs to be cleaned carefully. Don't put it, don't just put tap water in it and then toss it in the sink, okay? Put a little water in it to dilute whatever blood is left in that and drink it, okay? Then rinse the cup out and throw, I, we throw the water outside. If you drop some crumbs of the body of Jesus, catch them on a cloth on your table, then toss those outside on the ground. Uh, don't put them in the trash. Or, Collect them and, you know, get them with your finger and eat those. Consume them. That's what it's for. So now let's circle back to this question that started all this. If you're not a priest or a bishop, can you consecrate the elements of Eucharist? Can you do that for a communion meal at your house? Technically, maybe you can. I doubt that God is going to strike you dead with lightning or anything like that. But the church has not authorized me to condone that practice. Okay? If you want to celebrate Eucharist at home, let's arrange so you can have some reserve sacrament and do a deacon's mass at home. Do you have to follow the prayer book for a deacon's mass? Well, use it as a guide, you know. Take the parts and pieces that are there uh, as a guide so you don't miss anything. But no, you don't have to follow that exactly. When Debbie was sick with cancer, we did communion every day. And we usually did it from reserve sacrament. I would uh, uh, consecrate elements on Sunday. And then we would take some reserve sacrament from that. And I would do a deacon's mass with Debbie. And we would do that every day. And I used the prayer book for a guide. I didn't have to do that, but I did. It's just, I like it that way. Okay, so now you know everything there is to know about the Eucharist. So for the WebEx folks, what questions and comments have you? Just as a reminder to us, where in the Book of Common Prayer do we find uh, the needed instructions for the Deacon's Mass? 396, page 396. 396. That's in a 1979 Book of Common Prayer, which is kind of the latest ecumenical version of the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, the scriptures in there, the, um, uh, the, the liturgies, etc., have been approved by many liturgical and sacramental churches. That doesn't make them perfect, uh, doesn't even make them right in every case, but boy, I'm telling you, the Book of Common Prayer is just full of scriptural prayers, scriptural liturgies, really great ideas and concepts. So just don't, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater just because some of it might not be the best. Don't miss the good stuff in there. Well, what about, say, crackers or melba toast versus a loaf? 
because the former are not broken in the same way the bread is broken. It, uh, if you're using a cracker or Melba toast, when, it, when you break it, it makes lots more crumbs, right? I believe, personally, that Jesus at the Passover meal that is our example for the Eucharist, I believe that Jesus used matzah. He used unleavened bread, and it was probably flat bread. So a Kenyan that uses chapati might actually be closer to the kind of loaf that Jesus used than us with a loaf of bread. I think that a cracker, a melba, a matzah, a piece of bread, whatever you want to use, it just needs to be sort of in that category. Uh, Peter, for you in Hawaii, I would not use uh, Hawaiian bread because that is a yeast roll. <laughs> it's not unleavened. But if you had to, if you had to, <laughs> you know, like I said, you know, I'm sure that the Lord, if, if we were looking, casting about, saying, Lord, I really want to have communion today, but I can't find any matzah or chapate or regular bread. I'm, all I got is this Hawaiian, this yeast roll, this uh, Sister Schubert's yeast roll. I'm going to use that. The Lord would be going, woohoo, you're going to do communion. He wouldn't care that it's leavened, okay? <laughs> At least that's what I think. But, 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 loaves of bread are raised. That's true. Uh, I'm not sure that when Paul said loaf, that necessarily meant a, a yeast-raised loaf of bread. In other words, okay. the term, the Greek term loaf then, I don't know that it meant that. Okay. I don't know. Maybe it didn't. Paul thought using yeast was okay. Who knows? I just like to try to find the symbolism and stick with it, you know, because that, that adds to the richness of what we're doing. Any other questions or thoughts? Well, going back to Peter's question, uh, you know, the very original Passover meal by the Jews in Egypt uh -huh. was unloved. Right. You know, they, they had to make it real quick and eat it very quickly um yeah so that's why the loaf we use is an unleavened loaf and it would just make sense that jesus who fulfilled all the law would have used an unleavened you know loaf yeah if i can use that terminology then why do different denominations differ as to how they serve communion and the frequency and this is just doctrinal. Like some do it once a month. Well, like for instance, uh, the Methodist Church, for when John Wesley was going about riding on his horse, forming churches all over the United States, he uh, instructed folks to celebrate Eucharist once a week. And so for a long time, that's what Methodist churches did. But now you'll find Methodist churches that have decided they don't want to do that for whatever reason. They'll celebrate once a month or once a quarter. Generally speaking, my experience has been those churches that have a lower view of the Eucharist are more likely to celebrate it less often, especially if they don't believe it's the real presence of Jesus. If they believe it's just bread and wine that symbolizes the body and blood of Jesus, then who cares, you know? Well, and they're ignoring the scriptures about, you know, when the apostles, whenever they got together, they had communion. Right. But, and so now we're throwing it out. <laughs> well, but, you know, that's, that's their choice. And I, and I, I don't want to throw shade on those folks and tell them you're not going to go into heaven and you know all these kind of things i'm just i'm just going to say for me in my house uh, i love the richness of how we do the eucharist and i want to maintain that i want to enjoy that and be able to really flow in that in that rich worship
especially with all the scriptures behind it, with all the writings of the early church fathers. I just I feel like I'm in a comfortable place, you know. I'm safe doing it this way. Why don't we administer communion to children once again? Well, there there are some, there again. This goes back to different denominations and different churches that do things different ways. There are some, like I believe the Anglicans in Kenya, make a big deal of first communion and hold it off until what children are in their early teens or b nearly a teenager. Uh, Roman Catholics, there are some Roman Catholics that will have First Communion when a child is six or eight or ten, but some wait until confirmation. I personally don't understand why you would do that. If that child has been baptized, why in the world would they not receive the body and blood of Jesus? I think they need to be taught so that they're taking it properly. Well, of course. Well, sometimes they're too young. During the Passover, my impression is that all families, which everybody in the family... The celebration of Passover that I've seen was centered, it, it included children and it was really centered around... Uh, transmitting the history to children. So children would ask questions and then the adults would dramatize uh, uh -huh. the events of the Passover as answers to, to retell the stories of what God had done and why they do the things that they do on Passover. What do they need? Right. The children would ask questions and the adults would give answers. Well, plus the, plus the children had a role. They had different roles in Passover. They did different parts of the celebration. Oh, does this also go back to the fact that baptism was done? Yeah, in the, in the early church, you got to remember that infant baptism was common. You don't find anybody, any of the early church fathers, saying that you shouldn't baptize children right away. Uh, matter of fact, some claimed that they were baptized. Uh, I, I can't remember now who it was, but he claimed he was baptized by the Apostle John. And there was another early church father that was baptized by somebody else, and one of the apostles, as a child, as a baby. And so uh, because that's a fairly common practice, and again, that's a whole different teaching about why would you baptize children when they don't know the difference between right and wrong, it, I tell you, it's a little bit more of a baby dedication, bringing them into the kingdom of God, uh, acknowledging the fact that because of their Christian parents, they are, as Paul said, consecrated to the Lord. They are set apart for holy use. And it's things like that. It has really has nothing to do with forgiveness of sins because a baby hasn't sinned yet. They don't know what sin is. But as soon as they do, you want them to accept Jesus. You know, you want them to accept him in, in their heart. But anyway, the point is, if that child has been baptized, uh, m many Christian communions, including ours, believe that if the child has been baptized and you can explain to the child what's going on, that they can receive Holy Communion. And I don't know if y'all remember or not, but when your children were small, we would have communion service. And I mean, the kids would run up to the communion table serve me first serve me first i mean to them it was the most exciting part of the whole service and when they received communion they said they it, it they felt something it you know it touched them in a, in a certain way and their innocent little hearts didn't know any better you know and here they are receiving the body and blood of jesus and to them they felt that it was special to them so to me to withhold that from children is I don't. I just don't think that's a good thing. And I know that there are some denominations. I was part of one for many years that do not um, serve what they call the Lord's Supper, same thing as communion, to um, any 
anyone who has not received Jesus as their Savior. Right. Obviously, that excludes a lot of children. And yet, when you look at it, when you consider the Passover that all of this is modeled after, I don't think when they were sitting there getting having the Passover, getting ready to uh, leave Egypt, that they were saying to their kids, you can't have any. <laughs> right. You know? Right. Um, Especially when they had to eat the whole mess. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, now, Libby, the early church fathers did say that if someone is not a Christian, they should not be served communion. But the implication was they're talking about adults. If you have baptized a child, maybe they don't know Jesus as their personal Savior yet. But the way we operate in our families, most of our kids, by the time they're three years old, you ask them, do you have Jesus in your heart or where's Jesus? They'll point to their heart. You know, yes, they have accepted Jesus as their personal Savior. So, there, you know, there may be a technical transition time in there. That's why baptism kind of covers that for us, at least theologically. And that's why when, you, when we have guests come and there are small children at communion time, I'll ask, have the children been baptized? If they say no, then I don't serve them communion. So we've, we've kind of made that demarcation in the charismatic Episcopal church that if you're not baptized yet, you shouldn't receive communion yet. So, but anyway, that's a good point and a good comment. Well, I'm going to call this a wrap. I'm going to call this a teaching. And next week, Lord willing, if I can figure out how to do it, we're going to set up the YouTube camera so that I can do what's called an illustrated Eucharist. So as I go through the steps, we'll talk about what I'm doing and, and why I'm doing it that way and those sorts of things. And like I said, it'll be a challenge because we've got to get the WebEx, the communion table, <laughs> the camera. But I'm sure the Lord's going to give me wisdom on how to do that. 